today we're going to talk about how we can enhance speaking opportunities in our going to the nitty gritties of the all the theories and methodologies that have gone into the uh, this field that that actually leads us nowhere and i want you to reflect on this slide for a moment uh, and tell me what do you think about this all right uh, teachers sometimes incorrectly assume that the input provided in the classroom uh, will always be converted into intake. How far do you agree, guys? Yeah, not it doesn't. Yeah, in fact, it doesn't in the in the kind of uh, me measure that you'd like to. Right. Uh, usually, the speaking starts with a very small step towards a bigger one. So think big uh, and start small, and you you're going to learn faster. Uh, that means a small measure. The things from the small measure, it is a stepping stone towards the bigger things. Uh, teach me and I forget. Teach me and I remember. I involve me, I, rem I learn. So it's all about evolving uh, into uh, a good speaker with the help of the modifications of teachers on hand. And uh, look at this picture and how beautifully this, you know, the man is trying to mold the shape of this. So that's what our job is. What we learn becomes part of who we are. In fact, it's more with the uh, I mean, social cultural aspects, and it has to deal with where we live, what kind of life we lead, and what kind of people we associate with. If you talk to a man in a language, you understand that goes to his head. And if you talk to him in, in his language, that means L1, that goes to his heart. Uh, actually, it's Nelson Mandela, he talks about, I mean, this talks more about the importance of first language, I mean, a mother tongue, into the making and acquisition of the second language. So uh, if, 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 if uh, all of us come from a background where we have our mother tongue, along with the others' uh, language that we aim to learn. Now the question is, uh, augmenting opportunities of spoken production. Are we always confused between this or that? What does this stands for? What does that stands for? Any idea, guys? This is a very deep ocean. We are afraid to jump into and drown. And then we have, we're pushed against the wall, right? We have lots of oddities, or lots of stumbling blocks when it comes to being fluent in our speaking, especially the low level learners, right? So uh, the, the whole point is how not to leave the child drowning and how not to keep the child away from swimming. So it's like negotiating the path to success one by one. This, this the wall stands for all those oddities that our society, our people, our, our you know, restrictive uh, textbook defines us to be. So it's not about choosing either of them, it's about taking both of them together. So it, it really works in tandem and is hand in gloves. In fact, we can't think of fluency uh, without being accurate. Uh, and we can't be accurate uh, I, I, uh, well, uh, without knowing the jargons of how to be fluent, like super segmental aspects of the, uh, that includes body language and other parts of the things. So, what I'm going to tell you is that there is a very strong link between the receptive skill and the productive skill. Uh, as, as we know, we're all seasoned players here. In fact, I'm a novice. I don't need to teach you the you know, theories, the methodologies, the concepts that, that go into the uh, production and the acquisition or the receptive skills. So much more depends on the receptive skills when it comes to productive ones. So we need to capitalize the natural link between speaking and listening. Now, what, what could be that natural link? Can you think of one link between speaking and listening, guys? Is there, a, is there any link at all? Now, what was the correlation between uh, the productive and, and receptive skills? Now, if we don't read, we don't write, right? And if we uh, don't, Listen, we don't speak, right? In turn, taking communication, listening to 
Christ the model for speaking right. So guys, we have some, some kind of you know, tokens, tokens of speaking. Listening can provide a model for speaking production. In fact, all that we listen and we assimilate and process those uh, tokens of the language are, are, are ultimately produced in what we say speaking. Now look at this first step towards a child. I mean, it's a basic user that we find most of our learners in our own place in our context. Uh, probably it could be level one leading to level four where we are aiming at having a proficient user or at least an autonomous or independent user. So our job starts not anywhere in between. Our job starts basically here with the child's first step and initiation process. Yeah, of course, Mustafa, pronunciation plays a lot of role because stress patterns and uh, voice modulate, I mean, tone and, 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 and uh, pitch uh, and the rising and falling tones do a lot of uh, impact on the listener as, as comprehension. Now, I'm going to go a bit into the theories and methodologies or the communication you know, principles that have been followed so far. If you, if you can see in the slide, we have most of those people, uh, 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 hundreds of years of the research, and what we have come to know that no method or methodology really works independently. In fact, we need to have an amalgamation, a kind of eclectic approach, a kind of judicious use of one or the other. It's neither a grammar and translation method of the olden times in the Greek, uh, that we began with uh, around 100 years ago, right? If you look into the history and we go down the memory of all those researchers that have gotten into the making of how to enhance the four basic skills, uh, personally speaking, I don't see any of the skills in isolation. I see it uh, as, a comp as a very strong bonding between all those forces and they need to be developed and need to be looked into so what I was particularly interested in of all these people is one of them is Del H. Himes, because he was the one who started with anthropologist linguistics. In fact, we started looking linguistics as one of the separate signs only after his dealing with this issue in the long run. And he was of the opinion that all those skills cannot be taught in isolation and cannot be uh, looked into as uh, independent of each other. So he came up with an acronym and that, that, that suits very well. You know, If you see this acronym of speaking, so speaking stands for uh, situation. What, is, what could be a situation? It could be a problem, problematic uh, uh, I'm an instance where the child finds himself into and he cannot express himself fully and is not understood or comprehended. Uh, participants could be like, I'm the presenter today and you guys are the attendees. So that doesn't mean that the, the, the participation is less or more. In fact, without your participation, my presentation shouldn't fall flat. Right, guys? Do you agree with me? The participants is like a negotiation of the language, right? Now, uh, think of the ends. What are the objectives or the goals that we aim at when we talk about any kind of uh, staging of any uh, uh, lesson, whether it's writing or reading or speaking? In fact, when I look at speaking, it's no different from writing. So we initiate with the, in the free writing, with the first draft, with lots of penalties and errors. Similarly, in the case of uh, speaking, we tend not to penalize our speakers. We tend not to polarize self-confidence to begin with. And we try tolerating most of those faults or errors that are not likely to impede the comprehension, right? Now, what do you think of the act sequences? Now, every act of speaking or presentation takes about certain stages, like it could be a pre-stage. Yeah, thank you, doctor. Uh, to the act of sequence, like even our lessons are sequenced. We have got stages. 
like pre-task, a post-task, an initiation lead-in or all. So when it comes to speaking, in terms of prepare mentally, we negotiate the kind of diction, the kind of vocab, the kind of lexis, the chunks, and all that. We try to assimilate and process it before we really blurt out. That's what we call the utterances. Now, whether it's, it's a single word, a single syllable, or a prolonged or a sustainable level of utterances that we call interactions, with, uh, ultimately, they all have act sequences. So the key to, key, key to all kind of productions or utterances or, in, uh, you know, uh, what we call uh, communication um, the, in, in the true term, they all end into the result of how comprehensible, how well understood, how well reciprocated we end up with. Instrumentalities, that's like the musical instruments, you know, Sabita Rahman must be, you know, associating with the instruments. Because as we try to come up with the tone, the tune, the, the, the relations, correlations between all those kind of musical lyrics, we have got instruments of supra-segmental linguistic instruments like pitch. We have got syllables and stresses and weak forms of, and, and strong forms of, and then we, with the, 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 the emphasis shifts depending upon the mood, the kind of you know intentions that you want to create, the kind of impact you want to create in the listener. So depending upon who the who our target audience is, who the target uh, language is, our instruments may vary. Then comes the norms and genres. Norms could be social, could be uh, uh, the the kind of scene that is set up. Like I can't be quite liberal while presenting here. Uh, because of the, I mean, in, in, in terms of the choosing the words, the diction, the style, because it's a very formal kind of presentation. So I must go by the norm set for these kind of occasions. And genres could be uh, like, you know, novels and, 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 and uh, prolonged stories and anecdotes and kind of. So it's all intended essentials of what we aim at when we try to produce utterances as, at, at a sustainable level or at a low level. Uh, so this acronym I really liked, and it, it delves deeper into all the kinds of facets that are involved in the production stage. Going on to, we have got lots of theorizing principles and all that, but what that um, entail for us, in our teaching context at ELI, or teaching uh, English as a foreign language, a second language, you say, now what, we're trying to aim at is coming up with some kinds of uh, principles, if, if, you, if you like to say that, principles or approaches. In fact, I'll prefer calling them approaches because these approaches are the way we approach the problems. If the speaking is a problem, I mean, if the child is haltingly, uh, I mean, slow and he doesn't get up, so we try to initiate certain tasks so in, in the smaller scale, we have gap filling activities. You guys, as a practitioner, must be familiar with what, it, what are gap filling activities. Anyone? Any input from you, sir, you guys? Gap filling activities? Why do we have gap filling activities in speaking and, in fact, even writing? You know, why, why do we have? We expect our learners to provide some kind of uh, bits and pieces of the language. It could be certain idioms or phrases or chunks, but I'll prefer those kind of gaffling activities where we have to supply chunks. Because ultimately the language learned well, spoken well, only when it's, it's, it's memorized or whether it's reproduced in form, in form of larger chunks. Uh, I mean, in the lexical sets, uh, in, in the form of collocations, in fact, Whenever we speak, whenever we write, in fact, we are not writing um, in syllables. We're writing words. We're writing syntaxes. We're writing uh, some sort of, you know, phraseology of some sort of clauses, right? Uh, so the common phrases are really handy in teaching and in learning the language faster. So in TBL, um, what we said, task-based learning, if you could rename them, what else can you call this task-based learning, guys? What else can you say that about task with learning? It could be a project base. It could be, yeah, you'll see it correct and properly. You see the Lexus. Yeah, right, Mustafa. 
So it could be a project-based learning, it could be a task-based, it's an extended form of gaffling activity. It has its own pros and cons and it really works fine with certain groups of which they have already acquired a sufficient level of uh, linguistic competence, but not always. You know. What the problem is with all the methodologies, we are laying too much emphasis on communication. In fact, that has become a cliche. When we say communication, what do we understand by communication? And, and communicative competence. It's, it entails uh, the whole world of it. It's not just uh, one aspect of it. This, this pedagogy has stayed here for almost uh, 50 years now without much research into the modifying of this. And with the advent of uh, the education technology, all those theories are, are probably they don't work in our context to the extent we'd like them to. Now look at the four kinds of, uh, the four aspects of uh, 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 language teaching when it comes to spoken production. Now we go into the grammatical aspect. In grammar, uh, we can have, you know, uh, technology, vocabs, and word sentences, formations. Then in the discourse markers, we have coherence. And what is important is really social linguistic aspect of things because we have to vary of not using the taboo kind of language, uh, the kind of, you know, informality the kind of uh, you know, a choice of the words, the kind of you know, uh, kind of uh, acquaintance and friendship, the kind of I mean, usually uh, how do we uh, 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 try to establish contacts to establish? There are two basic ways of driving the ideas home. Anybody who can come up with those two ways of driving ideas home and to communicate, what are two those two ways, guys? You're too familiar with them. What are those two ways? Why do we communicate? We we communicate to the starting with the word tra t, and the other word starts with what? Messaging. Yeah, that's correct. Message. But the word starts with t, and the word starts with c. What can what can you come with word t? Transferring transaction. Great, Muhammad Shoaib. It is transactional, in fact. And we do it by driving the idea across, maybe in phrases, in, in clauses, in sentences, and in, in prolonged, and even super segmental, like when we stop for pauses and those sign postings, they're very, really important to get us going in the speaking. And most of the even profession speakers, the best speakers, they have to use the pauses, uh, the natural pauses. In coding, yes, of course, we decode in code, and we try to code in our own ways. So we have transaction and we have we have interactional. So what comes the, the problem lies with interaction. Why? Because in transactional, uh, we actually using most of the chunks chunks. That's why Dr. Brown had all uh, uh, impressed upon his his I and mean, the other guy also. So we use mostly the larger chunks of the language to transfer, and it's easier to grab them, acquire them, and remember them, even by rote learning. Those chunks are handy, and most of the time we are actually using the, 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 those chunks. Uh, uh, in, in the interactional pattern, we may have to speak for long, where we need lots of lexis and lots of uh, variations in the, in the kind of uh, tokens of the language. But in transactional, there are set patterns, like if I have to call on telephone to anybody, I don't need to know much. Hi, hello, and how are you, and how are you doing? And, and moreover, this, this, this has always been there for hundreds of years. There's nothing has changed. In fact, they were transferring knowledge, and chunks are quite handy. Well, yeah, yes, Dr. Uh, Muhammad Ra, you're right. Because we always try to you know, uh, get into bits and pieces. We can't have the whole sentence wrote, uh, whole sentence, uh, you know, by, by rote learning. So it's better to either paraphrase, uh, circumlocate, or, or, or try to reinforce or consolidate the language. Now let's look at the features of the language and how do we develop these features in the long. Now see the smallest feature of the language could be phoneme, uh, could be morphemes and they have syllables. So then comes the native speakers that have natural advantage on how to stress on the what kind of syllable because their, their ears are so tuned to it, they're not foreign to them. But non-native speakers like us, we have to struggle a lot in order to see where this stress and emphasis shifts from syllable to syllable, especially multi-syllabic words. 
Moreover, when we so it's, it's a form of a noun, we have a different stress. We form a verb, a different stress to begin with. We have um, adverbs and, and adjectives and persona and that. So it's really hard getting to know where the syllable stress shifts. And moreover, English being a very notorious language because it acquired words and lexes from all other languages, from uh, right from the Germans and from so it's notorious and it's some of the words and it's, it doesn't really make sense. It's not very scientific to say. So with morphemes and yeah, uh, it is yeah, it is notorious. Now lately, I must confess that there's an Indian word that's called at never that has gone into the Oxford Dictionary. Now, if I ask some non-native or non-Hindi speaker to say that word, at nerva, it would be like a harrowing experience for him. So from phoneme, morphemes, we get the words, we get the phrases. When you have the phrases, certain phrases have to be pronounced more longer and louder to create an impact on the, on the listener. So we have a stress rhythm, we have intonation, rising, falling. When you're questioning, we have a different intonation. When we are trying to seek information, there's shifts. So we have certain clauses, and we have, we have main clause, and we have secondary clause, and we have multiple clauses. And when we are, become a seasoned player behind the driving seat of the speaking, then we start co-joining with them with, with, with a kind of you know, conjunctions and all. So then comes the discourses. Uh, utterances could be prolonged, pretty, pretty you know, uh, sophisticated kind of language. And then we have the whole text with biases, with, with the prejudice, and, and we have the writers and all those things. So education technology has made it, made us, um, made it easier for us to comprehend at a very superficial level, because we're not trying to code or decode the things, and we're not trying to get at the inner line meaning and the intentions of the, those who, who, are, who write of the biases. Now let's come to our context and our teaching the basic fluency at the cost of not going, uh, not, not, not taking the rest, I mean, hazards of, of, uh, of teaching them bad grammar and making them a bad uh, speaker ultimately. So we keep correcting with gently, uh, like a faithful guide and presenter, and a delayed approach should be much better. And, and, and really, I mean, we don't have to mar the frequent I mean, fluency of the children, whatever comes, whatever kind of utterances comes in. Because the child ultimately is, is, is his L1 interference will be there because he has attained so much in the L1 and he is not going to lose now. So I would see L1 not as a deficit, not as, as, as a really a stumbling block or detrimental to learning or, or to speaking or being fluent. In fact, I see it as a great friend because the child draws so much of schemata, so much of you know his prior knowledge, his world knowledge, and he has already mastered all the super segmental of the language and believe me most of the languages work almost in a similar fashion uh, when it comes to grammar just 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 put something here and there just tweak the things you know when it comes to preposition when it comes to you know uh, you know prefix and suffix and all those kinds of things so when we ask the children to read aloud what are we doing in fact we're trying to them to, to look at them how the words sound like if they're familiar with the sound they immediately get to see the things so the sound symbolizes the things. So each each phoneme stands for is, is a particular sound. Orange could be apple, and apple could be orange. So it's not about apple and orange. It's about why, how do we have given the nom, nomenclature of them. So the student's response will be, uh, I mean, sometimes half a zero and sometimes. So if we, there are some certain ways of I mean promoting fluency among them, that, that's called oral diary. I mean, let the child, you know, uh, tape himself. He has a mobile phone, most of the students. Let him do the mistakes and let him have a small chunks of whatever he feels in the morning, a day-to-day, -day, uh, you know, diary of activities. Group presentation, it takes, a, it draws a lot of, you know, uh, you know strength in the child, uh, especially the shy ones who have a lot of inhibitions in him and those who haven't participated before in a prolonged kind of discussion, and if he hasn't got the prime knowledge of the world, he hasn't participated. It takes a, a larger lexis, and then, but the picture description comes to the low level. You just show the picture, ask him to describe what, what the child sees, and then he immediately gets into contact with the things he has seen. If he has seen, he will immediately tell you. And if he hasn't seen, you simply describe him in a simple story. And the storytelling is a great way of getting the child involved, especially if, you, if the child can identify with his personal life 
So it's story about, and, and a chain storytelling, now you get, get this ball rolling, set the tone, set the scene, and ask the child to come up with his own brilliant ideas. We can create riddles and we have the role plays all, always, you know, like a teacher, student, and police, and, and we can always think of an imaginary world. Now the best is, is it takes to draw a lot of competence on dramatic monologue, radio drama, and jazz. I mean, EL Tira, well, these things are outdated now, but the, the, these are some of the brilliant examples of how we can, we can uh, train the children on the basics of how to come up with certain kind of utterances, maybe lopsided, maybe full of, full of mistakes and all that, but they can always be taken care of as long as the te teacher is there as a trustee and a guy and a sympathetic listener. So what we need to be first, we have got to sympathize, empathize with them as a passive listener. When we talk about speaking our trends and not even the application of other uh, I mean skills, uh, you can see on the slide the real world is like this. Our real world is like you know we have the internet, we have music, like we have podcasts, we have voice threads, we have chat, we have virtual classrooms, and we have subtitled forms and for some context and all. And we do have to associate with native speakers, and they really pose a challenge in in comprehend comprehensibility. Uh, in fact, because of their you know, long vowels, short vowels, and the kind of, you know, they're so tuned to the kind of, uh, uh, you know, shortened kind of contact uh, and, 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 and abbreviated text. You know. and so what is the need of the hour is to encourage our child to use the authentic language. When I, when I talk about authentic language, do you have any idea what authentic language I'm talking about? Guys. Guys. Guys, can you come up with something, some, some, some example of an authentic language in the main context? So we need to know, this guy is selling a fish. We need to know the name of the fish. We need to know the, 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 the you know, uh, where the fish is, is bought and sold. We need to see the fish market. We need to see how people react. We need to smell of the sniff. And we need to get to the, the, the nitty gritties of that place exactly. Every language is in the context. Yeah, we must need the language not out of context, but in the context we like to set up. So we need to, so good speaking, listening characters in phase, and we can see what are those things that we entail. We have listeners who are, we, we need to be respected for not only listeners, uh, but we have to be polite and interested in what we are listening or speaking. And, and behaviorism, our mannerism uh, actually uh, uh, you know, uh, tells a lot the way we uh, utter, uh, the way we speak, how do we express ourselves. So <clears throat> we need to uh, look at the, and a good speaker listening characters that we have to be patient to listen. And these good speakers uh, speak in a style of Uta, their listener will understand. So what is important and, and is that it's not your own lexis or degrade, I mean, you, you don't have to upgrade or degrade your own lexis. You simply adjust to what kind of you know language and the target audience you are looking at, you are aiming at. Is is the idea well driven? Is, is the idea well contrived? Is the idea you know, well conveyed? So good speakers will talk clearly, not too fast. Uh, uh, probably I'm 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 going too fast simply because I've lots to say and lots to cover other things. I only lost five minutes in the first initial and uh, this presentation. That's why. Well, forgive me, uh, and I'm, I, I hope I'm intelligible to you and everybody can understand me well. I'm not posing any challenge in that respect. I'm, I'm, I'm loud enough and you're heard. Yeah, yeah, that's great. You're good to hear that. Good speakers use language expresses how they feel and avoid slangs and form of speaking. Now, I'm not at a liberty to use my own, you know, slang and, and degraded and, and, and demeaning and, and defied in language. At this because it's a very august occasion where we have got to uh, cater to the distinguished uh, guests and they're all experts in their own fields. Uh, you see this little child, she seems to be a bit lost, probably because she's not getting the kind of attention that she deserves. So this is really pathetic. Uh, it's, it's pity that we don't allow the children to come up with whatever goes into their heads, into their mind, psychological level, physiological level. Uh, so we have to accord the opportunities to initiate oral communication. It could be a simple you know, gesture, posture, 
uh, your prompts, your storytelling, your daily diary, your whatever you know uh, I'm going to format you use. What is important is that let the child come up with whatever you know. Uh, it's usually said that if you want your child to learn, you know, cooking, leave the child in the kitchen. Let him, you know, uh, break some pots and pans, and he will come up with some kind of, uh, you know, dishes, you know, whether it's tasty or not. So we have to allow them a fuller extent of opportunity and, and the kind of, you know, uh, 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 learning environment, the basic learning environment where it conduces, it, it's really congenial. And moreover, when it comes to real interactional or, or, or transactional you know, communication, you will be surprised to know that most of our communication actually depends on supra-segmental aspects. Like 38% of all messages communicated through tone of voice. So if you are louder, you are angrier. If you are slow and submissive and you are trying to beg or, or, or asking for a charity, you won't shout, right? Do we shout when we beg or we ask for charity? We can't. So uh, around 55% of overall messages communicate through body language. So our body is the biggest conveyor, the biggest you know, uh, communication you know, wheel, a tool that we, we, we uh, use in our L1 uh, and, and L2 and L3, whatever the other languages come for. So it, we uh, you know, capitalize on our you know, gesture and potion and demeanor and the way we talk, the kind of smile, the radiance, the glow on our face, the kind of confidence that we repose in our learners from day one. The child, the learner must understand that the teacher is always there to help out, to, to uh, lend a helping hand, whatever situation may be, whether it's stammering, whether it's uh, stuttering, whether it's the child doesn't look at and doesn't get the right kind of lexis, so uh, every, every time the, the teacher is always there, the teacher will never betray the child, the learner. So if that kind of confidence is generated among people, it's going to be wonderful in, in acquisition of the language. Uh, I, I, I must tell you that, you know, that even our president of America, he stammers. I heard him stammering because he's a speech impediment. And the, the, the guys in the Churchill and, and the, the, but still they have managed to, uh, be so communicative, effective in the approaches. So meaningful context is very important as opposed to uh, uh, too much of um, emphasis in rote learning. The three stage in-class teaching could be like controlled structure and could be like in you know, a partly teacher-led, could be rehearsed interaction. I mean, like you uh, uh, tape yourself, you, you videotape yourself, uh, you try to uh, see how you look like, and let it be lifelike and fully free interaction, the warm and appreciative learning environment. This warmth and appreciation is really important. Now, what are the strategies that we develop through these kind of staging of the lessons? You know? Now, developing a speaking strategy might involve a lots of videotaping, a lots of audio taping, a lots of you know, uh, participation through debate, uh, through group work, through you know, uh, hand gestures, emotions, and activities. So usually the problem that we come across in the low level uh, competent uh, children are like these. Look at these bubbles and you'll find the problems that we have uh, in our classes. So usually the good ones, the strong children, they dominate the conversation. How, how are we going to come up with that? Assign them certain challenging and more um, above the above level of the task so that they also feel challenged a bit. Don't only challenge this, the, the low competent students or low level competency, they challenge the strong ones also. And if your students seem unmotivated speaking to us, let them join hands with certain situations or, or, or real life situations where they are necessitated to speak. And there's no way out. If, if we go to a foreign land, we, I'm, I'm in Japan and I don't, uh, uh, nobody speaks English, I have to learn a bits and, uh, uh, and pieces of uh, bits and, and, and tokens of Japanese. To be, to be you know, heard, to book a flight, to book a ticket, to book a, uh, you know. <clears throat> so of course, I mean, we, we need to uh, uh, acquire some sort of I mean, basics. And, and, and sometimes the students don't know where to start. They're so too shy, too inhibited in the approach. And they, so we need a nudge. They are low, low, low level business. And they have to employ them the job. My students are unwilling to speak in class. 
unwilling not because that he is a dumb or or, or he's a he's an uh, retarded or i mean there's nothing like that every child is equally gifted believe me and it, we need to ju- uh, nudge we need to prompt we need to sympathize we need to take them along along with like a, like a good the classes are too big so there is no way of monitoring if anybody has a chance to speak so as far as speaking is concerned much of monitoring is not not really uh, you know warranted in fact you have to keep away uh, stay back as if they don't feel your presence and they feel strengthened with your presence, not weakened. So if, if I have to set certain tasks outside the classroom, like we can have a weekly English conversation club. I mean, like we have some activities involved. I've recently, the ELI is, is arranging some of the activities. We can have conversions, conversational clubs. We can have English language theater club, annual performance, annual, not modular performance. I mean, every child has to perform something towards the end of the, uh you know module uh it can be done and cultural quizzes now since uh, the, the problem here we we all the students come from the similar background culturally so there are hardly any interactions or exchanges and so they don't identify with the uh, uh, world festivals celebrations and all uh, rest of the part of the world so we can have english language quizzes about the facts and fictions and english language cinema nights of course i mean we're not going to that extent now but and, 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 and to the extent of bringing a native speaker to class, uh, think of this as, as an option uh, to display native teachers into the classes for a while and ask them. I mean, it's a far-fetched idea, right? Right, guys? Will they be willing to, to offer this kind of service? You know? it's, it's practicable, but it's one of the bizarre kind of things that, that, that I'm thinking of, I'm sim- simply suggesting. You know? So uh, when it comes to education technology, we have lots of apps in that. We have been talking about most of the presentations, the apps that we can record, we can uh, videotape, we can uh, slide share, we can have you know, uh, polls and all. It's, it's, this morning, I, I talked about the polls and all, how, how we can get to know their yes, no questions. And so these kind of, and even Google is, is a very handy tool in translating most of 90 languages can be you know, uh, translated at, at, at one finger fingertip you know that's a glance so i mean there's not much harm in translating those kind of concepts or beliefs or systems that, that are really hard to explain it takes a, a lot of time the teachers struggling with explanation at hand and then it comes out scoffing that oh the child hasn't understood so there's no harm i mean it's not a taboo using the l1 language as far as practicable and and feasible when it's coming to achieving our ideas or the target language now we have uh, lots of you know audio video recordings and all. And there, this is a website where we can have discussion board. We can even our you know uh, Blackboard. We have Wiki. Uh, that's a wonderful app. Uh, Wiki. We have record and, and video audio tapes and all. There are so many. I mean, like in Japan, they have kachapaka. I uh, this kind of chit chat uh, and and celebrations and everybody indulge in lots of talking and speaking on that occasion. And there are lots of I mean, like blogging and, and, and thread, creating the threads and discussion boards and entry journal entries. Uh, and we have you know, j- uh, personal journals and audio journals that we can videotape to also, you can audio tape also, you can exchange this on WhatsApp. It's as simple as that. The education technology has really made uh, much of a task easier than cumbersome, in fact. Now, see this child, I mean, he's coming from uh, Absono Choni, does Abha. A forlorn and a lost child who doesn't have many friends to, so technology comes handy to him. He has a whole one in his hand, you know, in the form of a mobile phone. And he's going to uh, capitalize on lots of apps that are readily available all the time. So we have uh, to, to create the groups where we have stronger students pitted against the, uh, the, the uh, weaker ones. We have the, uh, those kind of students who are really can take lead of the situations, and we need to teach them sub skills teach them strategies, teach them what they cannot learn outside. We can and, and they, they break the frontier and break the barrier. It's a mountain. Uh, this, this slide tells us the lots of pods where we can record. And it's easy to, um, there is one Spotify. Uh, I have used it and, and uh, stream uh, Spotify. That's a wonderful tool. So we need to start a really small step. And we need to prepare them for uh, with simple control and then slowly release the band and slowly try to let them take the lead and become an autonomous speaker, autonomous learner, in fact, not speaker. Speaking, is, it doesn't go alone. You know? They have to be an autonomous reader, they have to be a writer. We have to understand the, 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 uh, the nuances. Uh, they have to understand the, 
you know, practicalities, the tokens, the, the, the system, the language, before they really come up with on their own too. So the real world uh, is, is very different from what we do in our classroom, in fact. In fact, we have to go by so many uh, other than what we are teaching through the book. All the books are really well, well uh, uh, you know, designed and really catered to all our needs. But we need to add up, add up our own things with the best kind of skills that we can have. Uh, I may be, uh, you know, uh, incurring the wrath of the native speakers because they won't go by, you know, uh, by this, this dictum, you know, see the world is looking at what the world is seeing all hundreds and thousands, hundreds of righteous Englishes worldwide. So our Englishes are a bit different from what we spoke in England and USA. And, and then, then we have got so many, you know, varieties and we have own varieties that we can feel proud of that instead of uh, shaming ourselves and kind of, you know, uh, uh, kind of version or kind of variety that we have. We don't have to be, you know, following and aping the native speakerism that might sound to be too intimidating for our own learners with l1 confidence and all so uh, why do we uh, you know run after things that really is not achievable it's not attainable it's not really productive and, and it doesn't allow us and it's it's really leave us you know pulverized with lots of you know uh, confidence shaking uh, so let the, let the learners be in control of uh, thank you so much you have been uh, great listeners